Okay, um, so we're coming to the end of the day, uh, but before we head off to pizza and drinks in the park, uh, we're going to have a paragraph session. So uh, I think we have a few people here in person who are going to deliver pitches. Uh, so yeah, come down front. Not sure. I'm not sure how well this will work hybrid of the scene. I think uh, Brandon, I guess, I'll go if you think I'm fine. Yeah, so you can hold. Yeah. Try not to move. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fine. So, I thought I'd start with focusing on the word heterogeneity, which is a word we've heard a lot today. And this is a phenomenon which doesn't just characterize um, disease in the aging population, but it is also um, common in a diametrically opposite context. And this is the healthy uh, transport development. And one of my research questions is to study uh, heterogeneity in childhood and adolescence, in particular to discover subtypes of neurocognitive development. Uh, by looking at features of neuroimaging and cognitive uh, and, and, and uh, demographic data. And the importance of this work is not just uh, in terms of seeing how deviations from normal healthy trajectories may be uh, predicted by early life factors such as poverty, but, and this might impede the majority of you today, but it um, may be linked to, if, if we think about heterogeneity in neurodegenerative disease as potentially being an interaction between um, indif uh, individual variation plus pathology, if we understand how diversity manifests itself early life in the early part of the lifespan, this might help us constrain models of later uh, of disease and, and later lifespan. My name is Fran Piondo and I'm a research fellow at the CMIC. Yeah, I had a Switch this place, switch this place, top left. Yeah, tell me when to start. See that, see that. Stop. The slide looks quite good, even though it's my own work. Okay, so I'm, I'm Dave. <laughs> I'm based at the uh, University of Southampton. Um, so I'm, I'm not clinical, I'm not really an academic. I've spent 30 years in engineering and then more recently dabbling in, in academic stuff. Um, uh, I got my PhD in 2018. Uh, I'm doing some sort of uh, research fellow uh, work. Um, so I've been looking at um, longitudinal uh, trajectories of decline, uh, by which I mean um, cognitive and functional, just to distinguish from the other things we've been talking about today. Um, and also looking at progression on multiple composite and single scales. Um, so as an example, top right there, where there's a, a number of trajectories um, over a number of different cognitive, functional, and global scales. And uh, what I do in my work is uh, cluster longitudinally um, according to, to severity of rates of decline. So the, the uh, blue, red, and green traces 
uh, show, uh, for example, on the, the very top most trace, there's CDR sum of boxes, rapid, intermediate, and slow rates. Um, uh, and using uh, one of the uh, KML 3D uh, algorithms to sort of partition those out and group them out. And this particular set of screen grabbed is from a poster done with my colleagues, uh, headed by Chris Kipps, down, down at Southampton. Um, and what we tried to do here was show that there's, a, there's an association between brain imaging uh, sort of data um, with uh, uh, affected uh, metabolic, uh, metabolic mechanisms uh, is associated with these rates of decline. Um, so I use uh, the longitudinal, longitudinal clustering to um, categorize and then um, regression models uh, to uh, characterize those, those rates. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, it'd be great to try and associate these with the various biomarkers, uh, inflammatory and uh, imaging uh, and genetic and others. Um, and we're looking at uh, different uh, databases, not just uh, Alzheimer's, but also Parkinson's and Huntington. Um, and I should just point out, this work is more applied to clinical practice, uh, prognosis and care planning. So it's very much a sort of patient facing uh, research rather than sort of the early disease pathology. Hello. Yeah. Okay, so my name is Maya Ferellas and I work, I'm a PhD student working with Alex, Danny, and John. John Shaw from the DRC is not here. Um, so my work focuses on multimodal modeling of aging and Alzheimer's disease from incomplete data sets. So for this, I use ACNI, which is an amyloid and rich cohort, as you all know, and INSIGHT 46, which is a preclinical first cohort. And why multimodal, as I say here, is I use MRI, CSF, plasma biomarkers, so um, various biomarkers. And then I use SUSTAIN, which as you know, is a, a data-driven, um, model that identifies subtypes and stages. And I use missing data adaptation because of the of using multimodal modeling, there is a lot of missing data. So I just adapted to say, so it deals with missing data. And my question here is, if we find this um, heterogeneity in the grade six, which is a preclinical cohort, can we identify who's on an amyloid decade process? And by comparing these results with the same uh, modeling in ACNI, can we see how these people are gonna um, are gonna uh, um, develop? Thank you. Develop in the future. So I think I'm slideless for this. Um, Hi everyone, so my name is James Cole, those of you who don't know me, um, I'm an academic staff member in Centre for Medical Image Computing, um, and my research is really uh, focused on modelling the ageing process, and I'm particularly interested in uh, the brain age paradigm, which some of you are really with, as well as uh, normative modelling, and I'm really interested in trying to figure out when does normal ageing become pathological ageing, and can we use that understanding to try and detect when people start to be at highest risk of disease. Um, I was really interested in Charlie's talk earlier about inf information. I feel like that's an underappreciated area in the brain imaging world. Um, and my hope is that my research into uh, aging and brain diseases can help us identify who's at risk early so we can identify optimal windows to intervene um, and predict people's outcomes. Um, so yeah. Hi, I'm Ian Axman. I'm from University of Southern California, uh, formerly of Pond. So I've been three and a half great years here with uh, Danny and Neil, and then um, working with Andre Altman in the combined lab. And so I, I picked up a lot of modeling um, expertise in sustain. And what's nice is that we, I've taken it across the pond um, to get to the US, but nobody's doing it there, which is pretty uh, great to expand into that. 
um, the area and um, they'd be able to apply it to, to different sort of aspects of Alzheimer's. So in particular, one of the things um, we haven't talked about at all in, in this uh, meeting, which has been great by the way, uh, is risk factors. So roughly 40% of Alzheimer's can, can be explained by the, by the risk factors, uh, sort of lifestyle and environment and health factors such as uh, whether or not you have high blood pressure or you know, lead an inactive lifestyle or you smoke, for example. So those, those factors really affect whether or not you're going to get a dementia in Alzheimer's. And what we don't know is how these subtypes are linked with these risk factors. That's actually what, what I want to look at over there in the States. So. Um, so hi, I'm Karen. I am the board the board registrar um, at UCL, and I'm doing a PhD at the moment on find the stages of presymptomatic frontal temporal dementia or FTD. And so far, so far, I've focused on defining the phenotype of FTD, look, looking at the language, behavior, neuropsychiatric, motor features, a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, my study cohorts have a genetic form of FTD, and these are the mutations listed here. Um, and this is really helpful because it means I can follow people who have this genetic mutation before they have any symptoms and follow their uh, pathway, basically. Um, uh, so my research aims to order data, um, looking at the clinical, cognitive, and imaging biomarkers, um, and sort of so we can look at ideally the stage, so the uh, prodromal stage where we get onto the Marfan symptoms, and the symptomatic stage when they develop meet criteria for dementia essentially, um, and so. That's really important for my ultimate goal, which is to produce a tool that can give staging and outcome measures important for clinical trials. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks uh, again to all the power pitches and keep it there. So now we're going to wrap up the day and uh, go down to the app restaurant in Lincoln's Infield. I think that information has been shared, uh, but if you don't know where you're going, well, 